This episode is on Josephus' book, The Jewish War. When I used to teach literature, I used to try to explain to students something that I know can be true by experience, and that is that there are multiple levels of literacy. So that is, while my fifth grade child, for instance, quote, can read, there are certain books she can't yet read, books I know she might enjoy later in life when her full reading capacity comes online. You understand. And from what I observed, like in myself and in my students, many a contemporary sophomore in college still isn't to the point they need to be at in terms of achieving full adult literacy to read some of the great books. It is the vocabulary, a little bit, and it's the attention span, for sure. And it's also an ability to grasp, sort of conceptually, what the syntax of a nine-line long sentence is doing. Especially if you've ever read anything like, you know, the Federalist Papers or whatever. So, how does one acquire this full-grown adult literacy? Unfortunately, there isn't really a shortcut. You just got to sit down in total isolation and stillness with unlimited coffee and a pen for underlining and commit to first reading one whole page, not missing a single word, and just labor at it. Which brings me to another thing I used to say to students, and that is, it simply is not the same thing to hear someone summarize a book as it is to read that book yourself. My favorite example used to be to say, you know, imagine yourself at a Justin Bieber concert or whatever, and imagine that it was awesome. You know, at one point he was dressed like Elton John and swinging from the rafters with his piano and singing Rocket Man while fireworks were blasting off from the top of the arena. You know, whatever. And now imagine going home after that concert to your college dorm and trying to explain... What happened at the concert to your roommate? Does it really even matter what you say? I mean, you might say something like what I just said, but is, you know, there's, there really are no words that you can produce that will substitute for and equal the experience of having been there, right? I mean, the guy who went to the Justin Bieber concert will remember it for the rest of his life, whereas the guy who heard it summarized will have forgotten it in two weeks. Well, why do I say all this? Because if I could recommend two books to take to a desert island with you for the rest of your life, the first would, of course, be the Holy Bible. In part because that's sort of cheating. It's like 80 books smashed together into one. But the second book would be Josephus' narrative history, The Jewish War. Yes, it is that good. But nothing I say in 45 minutes here can really give that goodness to you. And maybe more importantly, it's not the easiest reading, and it might not even be accessible to some of you, even if you decide to try reading it. I don't think I could have loved it before about age 29, but I definitely love it now. You probably have to read the Bible uh, a couple of times to get a sense what for, you know, sort of why it's so important. The, uh, the history of the book builds sort of to the destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. But it is presented as a very long story, beginning as far back as 37 BC or even earlier. The first thing to understand is that the Jewish civilization had acquired a great deal of power, even during the first temple period, which lasted from about 1000 BC to 587 BC. The simple description of the temple taken from the Torah or the Tanakh gives a sense of the financial and military power that must have been necessary to build such a landmark, fitted as it was according to 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, uh, which say, quote, it was, or its floor was wainscoted with cedar of Lebanon and its walls and floors were overlaid with gold amounting to 600 talents, or roughly 20 metric tons of gold. In gold alone, just in the gold plating, that makes it worth more than $70 million in today's money, and probably more. 
And there are passages in the book of Esther, for instance, which was set around 480 BC, indicating that even after the destruction of the first temple, the Jews managed to retain a serious amount of political influence and power, so much so that people were converting to Judaism out of fear, this, this according to Esther 8.17, and you should read all the way through nine, chapter 9, verse 2. The second temple then was rebuilt in 516 BC. So this gives you a sense that for, you know, even through the middle of that thousand years from like 1000 BC, time of Solomon's temple, all the way up through Herod, this is a powerful civilization and one that's able to survive all of those kinds of comings and goings of wars and tribes that I sort of described in the episode on Thucydides. And then there was the Maccabean Rebellion, which solidified Israel's reputation as a military power around 167 BC. Here, the temple was rededicated, and then the Hellenized king, Herod, finally topped it off, making it hugely ornate around 10 BC. Uh, Josephus himself describes the temple, I think it's maybe, there's way more gold even by the time it's it's sort of refurbished by um, Herod. Josephus himself actually summarizes the point I'm trying to make in book one of the Jewish War when he writes, quote, Of all the cities in the Roman Empire, ours was the one to reach the greatest heights of prosperity. So that's speaking of Jerusalem. This is basically where Josephus starts his narrative, describing all of the problems Herod had with his own family. It's really titillating reading. Um, Augustus was said to have joked that it was better to have been Herod's pig than to have been his own son. There was all kinds of lying and subversion and, you know, really sort of uh, threats of patric or what is it, what do you call it, patricide? Patricide, I guess, or parricide or something. And all the subsequent paranoia you would expect with so much jockeying for power and with so much wealth and extravagance at stake. And this is really the first false narrative that reading Josephus unravels for us moderns, or at least for those of us who, when picturing, you know, God's chosen people, maybe assumed that it was nothing but a bunch of pious people praying in a desert. In, fa in fact, far from it. The corruption in Judea matched and evidently exceeded even Rome's famous decadence. And this is all in book one, by the way, <laughs> of Josephus's, I think it's seven or eight books long. Um, I mean, you know, if you just read the first 70 pages of Josephus, I think you'll be hooked because, I mean, man, it was a rough time. Herod, King Herod died. You've probably, by the way, before I go on about Herod, you've probably seen Herod depicted in these ancient movies around the time of like Jesus' birth. He's depicted as this like, he, like what's the movie I'm thinking? I think it's Jesus of Nazareth, the uh, Zeffirelli movie where, I mean, it's like uh, he's he's got like cross-dressing, he's got like makeup on and he's effeminate and he's, you know, he's sitting there drinking wine and being decadent and so on. Like, Whatever you've seen of him, it's even worse than that. He died in 4 BC, and Archelaus took over, but he was soon rivaled by his brother Antipas, who claimed that the throne should be his. By 6 AD, Rome imposed a governor, but Josephus is careful to note that Rome showed great restraint given how disordered the Jewish kingdom was at the time. Here's a description, for example. Actually, this is, this is actually from earlier when Herod still ruled. Josephus writes, quote, The storm besetting Herod's house now shifted its direction to Alexander and settled in full force over his head. There were three eunuchs, eunuchs, who were particularly valued by the king. The third of the eunuchs put him to bed and slept in his room. Uh, the eunuchs confessed their sexual relation with Alexander. Herod, an aging rogue who dyed his hair, uh, let's see, blah, 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 the palace was a ghastly hotbed of criminal intrigue, 
Everyone was inventing charges against others to pursue political antagonism or personal hatred. Lies found immediate belief and punishment came even faster than the charges. Herod tortures his slave girls. There are rumors of poisoning, of coup. He comes down with some disease that makes him kind of lose his mind. I mean, again, whatever you've seen in the movies of this guy, it was worse than that. The crucifying and revolutions start by about 4 BC, and from there it just gets bloodier and bloodier. Josephus notes, by the way, that there were about 8,000 Jews living in Rome by that time, which I think is interesting, right? I mean, it, this is, we're talking about sort of the Jewish diaspora, but before the destruction of the temple, which does sort of beg the question, like, well, you know, I mean, I guess what are they doing? Like, why? I mean, you'd think they would either be... I guess like what you know convert to pagan romanism or be living in Jerusalem sort of where the Torah describes that they're supposed to be. In any case, Josephus gives a reasonably thorough description of the three major sects of Judaism. I think this is in book 2, the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the Essenes, and he tells of Pilate, Pontius Pilate, who was the procurator there from about 14 AD to I think 36 AD. Uh, the narrative actually goes pretty quickly from around the time of Pilate through the early 60s AD, which is, you know, sort of too bad in a way. But Josephus himself, I think, was born in like 37 AD. So, it, you know, I mean, I guess there either wasn't terribly much going on or it was, you know, going through a relatively calm period for a while. I know that there were expulsions from Rome of Jews in like 29 AD and again in 49 AD. So it wasn't totally smooth sailing between, you know, Rome and Jerusalem there. But um, in any case, his narrative go, is sort of quickly then hurrying to the big war, which is going to start around 66 or even 65, I guess, in a sense. So by that time, there was, Josephus writes, quote, a radical element and the hot-headed youths were burning for a fight. Basically, the Jews weren't enjoying the subjection of empire. Gentle, though Josephus says Rome's touch was, it sounds a lot to me like some wild Antifa energy, to be honest, and a complacent conservative core in Jerusalem who didn't agree, but who also you know, weren't dedicated enough to win the fight. I mean, they basically got too comfortable. Probably they were too rich too well-fed, too prestigious. I mean, it does say in the description of the temple that people would come from all over the world. And of course, like, you, you know the scene from the Bible where Jesus is tipping the tables over, the money changer tables. I mean, that suggests that it is a center of commerce in the region. This is, a, this is a quite a cosmopolitan place. I mean, I went into this a while ago on a different tangent somewhere, thinking about, is it possible that Jesus knew Greek? Because my understanding is that under... Um, was it Philip or Alexander? Somewhere in there, in like the 4th century BC, they made the Jews stop speaking Hebrew and adopt Greek as their own language. And, and it became like essentially illegal to teach your children to speak Hebrew as their first language. And this, of course, was a panic for the Jewish rabbis. They had to translate the uh, Septuagint into Greek. And, and so my understanding is that in lots of temples, Greek was the... Uh, common language. It's, it is possible that Jesus spoke some Greek and certainly that he encountered Greek speakers coming and going in Jerusalem at the time. As the war cranks into gear, Herod Agrippa II gives a really interesting speech. I'm going to quote here. He, he basically is trying to convince them that it's too late to revolt against Roman rule. They already accepted subjection. And he says, quote, as for this passion for freedom which you now profess, it comes too late. You should have fought long ago not to lose your freedom in the first place. Slavery is a painful experience, and any fight to avoid entering that state is justified. But once subjected, those who then try to break away are insolent slaves, not lovers of freedom. So the time when we should have done everything possible to keep out the Romans was when Pompey was invading the country, 
But our forefathers and their kings, despite financial, physical, and moral resources far greater than yours, failed to resist a small fraction of the Roman army. Are you then, after generations of subject status and so ill-equipped in comparison with those who made the original submission, are you going to defy the whole Roman Empire? Will you alone refuse submission to the masters of the whole world? Are you richer than the Gauls, stronger than the Germans, cleverer than the Greeks? It's a great speech, but of course they just ignore it. The ramping up for war continues There is mention of intensifying racial conflict between the Syrians and the Jews in Caesarea. Josephus calls this the old antagonism. He then writes, Josephus writes, quote, You could see cities full of unburied corpses, bodies of infants thrown on the bodies of old men, women left with not a shred to cover their nakedness, and the whole province riddled with unspeakable horrors. And even worse, then the constant atrocities was the threat of what was yet to come. When I say, when I, this is, that's the end of the quote, when I say that the coming of the Logos solved something, this is exactly what I mean. This terrible, terrible destruction, widespread and sort of centered in Jerusalem, starting in 66 AD. And by the way, just off my cuff here as I remember, Josephus over and over and over again emphasizes the fact that Rome did this with so much grace. They, they, they gave so many warning opportunities and that all, the violence that was done inside Jerusalem was done like among Jews, one Jew to another. The zealots, the Sicarii, these people sort of trying to, you know, pull off some sort of coup and, you know, make, the, make Jerusalem great again or whatever fighting with the more moderate factions and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and and you basically just had this kind of inter-Jewish civil war thing happening that Rome only showed up to try to settle, basically. So that's the circumstance on the eve of this big war. I want you to listen with me to two clips. One, the first one I've got from this... uh, sort of troll of a rabbi on YouTube who is basically, I mean, I call him that because he's basically, he spends his life trying to undermine and, you know, what does he say, like, like dispel Christianity. He, he reads all about it and then says it's wrong. And so this is Tobiah Singer, and this is his description of what he thought the, you know, of he, what he thought that the Jews at the time and even now think the Messiah should have been. And of course, they didn't think it was Jesus. So this is his description of the period. Tanakh tells us about the Messiah. We have so many passages throughout the Jewish scriptures that are pregnant with messianic prophecy. And scripture tells us a lot about the Messiah and what he's going to do. He's going to give hoichocha, which means rebuke to the nations. Nations will change their ways as a result of that. The Messiah is going to bring about a worldwide peace. Isaiah chapter 2, Micah chapter 4 nation will not lift up the sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. We have Isaiah chapter 11 using the metaphor of animals that are predator and prey, that they'll lie together without conflict. That's a picture of the messianic age. War will come to an end. The knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea. Same chapter, Isaiah 11 verse 9, the resurrection of the dead. Now, th- this is all hilarious to Tobiah Singer. He-, he thinks this is just a joke, and he goes on to say, like, I mean, give me a break. There's still war, you know? But, again, this is why it's so important to read Josephus. It's like, yeah, there's kind of war, but are there, like, bodies stacked, all, like, from one end of the city to the next? Is blood running as high as the horse's bridle? You know what I mean? Like, that's the dis- that's the scene that Josephus describes, and basically... Like, this is, I mean, if you read, like, Matthew 24, where Jesus talks about the coming horror, and then then it happens within a generation of his dying, it's over. Like, he says, some of you here will see within, you know, within this generation, the, the coming, the second coming, basically. And it's this, it's this destruction of the temple. This is a lost teaching in Christianity. Few understand it anymore, and it couldn't be more important. As I've said before, I think I've said before on this podcast, I, 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 I'm going to play you next a clip from this Chuck Baldwin guy. 
he's this preacher out in like Montana. I think he's a Protestant of one variation or another. But he understands this better than any preacher I have read. He also makes the point in this lecture. I wish I had printed it. I'll actually link to it in the YouTube video if you find this. He makes reference to uh, the, the Handel's Messiah being, especially the very famous, you know, hallelujah verse, right? Where, hallelujah, hallelujah, that, that everybody knows, every Christian grew up singing at Christmas time. It is a celebration of the destruction of Jerusalem because Christians all the way through the 18th century saw that as the fulfillment of the promises, of the promises and of the prophecies of the Old Testament and of Jesus. So when like Tobiah Singer makes fun of this stuff, what he's doing, I think, is basically relying on your ignorance. You're not having read Thucydides and Josephus and Polybius and understanding what like just how riven the world was, especially around the Mediterranean, with war, generation after generation, as I said in the Thucydides episode, they're just killing each other. They're raising their boys to be warriors as soon as possible to try to win these wars. Now, if you can't see that after 70 AD, and sort of especially after Hadrian, who sort of finally totally demolished Jerusalem in 132, things started to turn the corner, well, I think you're missing out. I mean, especially by the time of Constantine, the, Roman, the Holy Roman Empire takes over, there is peace all around the Mediterranean for a long time. This is, I mean, this is a vast improvement over what existed before. Here's Chuck Baldwin on what I'm talking about. Evident, in other words, by using Titus to be the one through whom the destruction of Jerusalem would come in itself was a miracle, a sign for the church forever that everything about the destruction of Israel was divine in origin. It was the fulfillment of prophecy, the judgment of God forever upon Israel, Jerusalem, their temple, and their religion. Think of it. Not a single Christian perished in the siege of Jerusalem. Think of it. Jerusalem is where the church began. Remember the day of Pentecost. 3,000 were saved, baptized, and added to the church in one day in Jerusalem. The church grew by leaps and bounds. But not one single Christian died in the siege of Jerusalem. They were dispersed in persecution. And those that weren't heeded the oracles of God pertaining to the destruction of Jerusalem and left before the siege began. When Jesus said, this generation shall not pass before all these things were fulfilled, it came to pass just as he said. A generation is 40 years in biblical terminology. Within 40 years' time, everything that Jesus had predicted had come to pass. So, I mean, I hope that's pretty amazing to you. And I even think that, in some sense, the resurrection of the dead may even be interpreted as those people, those Jews in Jerusalem, who essentially were marked or fated to die in this war because they locked the gates. They literally killed the whole city. And they left early because they had heard the teaching of Jesus and scattered like they knew they were supposed to. And so, as he says, they were saved. They were literally saved in that sense. This is what I mean when I say that the coming of the Logos solved something. By 66 AD, the war really starts in full. Uh, Vespasian is leading the Roman forces. He is careful to pick off one by one the seven or so cities under Jewish political control that surround Jer Jerusalem before getting to Jerusalem to you know, cut off food supplies and so on. Scenes like the one I'm going to read now are so common, almost on every page in, Jer in Josephus. Quote, One of the men standing with Josephus, and by the way, yes, that's him. He, he, he was there. He saw this firsthand. One of the men standing with Josephus on the wall had his head taken off by a stone fired from it. And as if thrown by a sling, his skull was sent flying for a third of a mile. And when a pregnant woman, just leaving her house at dawn, was struck in the stomach, the baby blasted out of her womb was hurled a hundred yards. Soon, Titus takes over as Roman commander. He literally prays to God. Josephus quotes him. He, he gives this whole long thing where he prays to God that God is on their side, on Rome's side. 
He ends by saying to his troops, trust that God is with me and supporting this drive. And Josephus certainly agrees with him in this, in this text. At one point, Josephus, describing Jerusalem, says, The partisan quarrels started in individual households, poisoning what had once been solidarity. Then family members severed all mutual links and joined others of the same political persuasion, whichever that might be. So there were soon substantial numbers in opposing camps. Faction was rife everywhere. End quote. The description of the zealots is amazing. I mean, from what I remember, they are this intense group of basically like legalists. They want everybody to, you know, intensify their religious practice. And I mean, they, they start to form like a secret police and start turning in people who aren't obeying the laws of Moses and stuff. And they want to basically like force it to be a, you know, holy city, more or less. On their tails, you find the Sicarii. These are these like essentially like assassins who uh, dressed like everyone else but walked around in the city with knives under their cloaks and would just kill in public anyone caught breaking one of the laws of Moses. I mean, this is a scary, scary time to have been in Jerusalem. Josephus himself was kidnapped into Roman custody and then made the official historian of the war he genu- genuinely seems to have sided with Rome and believed that God had abandoned Jerusalem. Uh, quote, for instance, he's, and I'm going to give you a bunch of instances of this in just a sec. He says, I think God must have condemned his polluted city to destruction and willed the purging of his sanctuary by fire. So I'm going to open my book now and just read you some of the sections that I thought would sound really interesting and like uh, hopefully this will just give you a taste for how engaging a read this is. Like it is so good and interesting. I'm going to read about five different sections here. So just uh, bear with me. Among the zealots, the Galilean contingent took the invention and blatant practice of new atrocities to unrivaled extremes. It was they who had elevated John to power, and from the autocratic position he had won with their help, he rewarded them with the license to do whatever any of them wanted. Looting was their passion, and they could never get enough of it. They loved ransacking wealthy houses. They murdered men and raped women for amusement, and they boozed away the proceeds of their blood-stained spoils. Sated with all this, and with no one to stop them, they went all effeminate, doing up their hair, wearing women's clothes, drenching themselves in scent, and applying eyeliner to make themselves pretty. And it was not just the adoption of female dress, they also played the female role in sex, and their total depravity had them inventing new and utterly obscene modes of intercourse. They treated the city as a brothel and wallowed in it, polluting every part of it with their contamination. They may have feminized their faces, but they kept the hands of killers. These, again, these are Jews trying to essentially take over control of the city. And they are the most religiously observant of the Jews, or, or at least they, they thought of themselves in those terms. I mean, as Josephus says, God must have perverted their minds. Josephus, because of all this stuff, absolutely takes the side of Rome. And he he seems to believe that God transferred his loyalty from Jerusalem to Rome during this war. Here's another quote. Um, The uh, as the so this was there were they still tried to keep the like sacrifices going at the temple and sometimes foreign visitors would come so it says the foreign visitors could shame the zealots out of their intransigence but then became they sorry but then became collateral casualties of the factional war the artillery missiles had the velocity to carry right through to the altar and the sanctuary landing on priests and sacrificers so that many of those who had journeyed from the ends of the earth to this renowned place which all men held sacred fell victim themselves before the animals they brought before sacrifice and sprinkled with libations of their own blood the altar universally revered by Greeks and barbarians alike. Natives and aliens, priests and laymen were a mingled mass of corpses 
and the sacred courts pooled with the blood of every sort of victim. Oh, my poor city, what did you ever suffer from the Romans compared to this? They invaded to purge with fire the pollution among your own people. You were no longer God's place. End quote. Or continuing, this is, this is Titus now. Titus uh, had taken over from Vespasian uh, by now. And um, let's see, he says, Realizing that any hope of safety now depended solely on his own resource, he wheeled his horse and, shouting to his companions to follow, charged straight into the enemy, set on blasting his way through to reach the rest of his men. What happened then was the most convincing proof you could have that God takes a hand in the fortunes of war and the perils of princes. Titus was wearing neither helmet nor breastplate. His excursion, as I have said, was for reconnaissance, not for battle. And yet, of all the missiles thrown or fired at him, not a single one touched his body. But as if there there was a deliberate missing of the target, they all whizzed harmlessly past him. Again, Josephus thinks God is protecting the Romans and helping them at this point because his own temple has been so trashed by the people who are supposed to be, you know, his priests. Um, <clears throat> on the bottom of, let's see, this is, uh, this is, it doesn't matter what page, but book five, section 346 or so, or, or 360, where am I? 363. So Josephus went round outside the wall, taking care to keep out of missile range but within earshot, and he made repeated appeals, calling on them to spare themselves and the people, to spare their country and their temple, and not to treat these concerns with a callous indifference beyond anything shown by the foreigners. So here's Josephus. He's going to yell up to them because he's outside the temple now. He's with the Romans, and he's going to try to convince them to stop this madness. Though they had no allegiance to them, the Romans respected their enemies' religious institutions and had so far left them untouched. But those who had been brought up in them and would be the sole beneficiaries of their preservation were evidently bent on their destruction. They could see in plain fact their strongest walls flattened and with two gone, only the weakest wall still standing. They knew that Roman power was irresistible and it was not as if they had no previous experience of being subservient to Rome. It might be a fine thing to fight for freedom, but they should have done this right at the start. Once subjected and submissive for long years, for them to try now to shake off the yoke was not so much love of freedom as deliberate suicide. Lesser masters could well be treated with contempt, but not men who dominated the whole world. Was there any land that had escaped Roman net, except perhaps some parts too hot or cold to be of any use to them? From every corner of the earth, fortune had passed to the Romans, and God, who transferred dominion from one nation to another, was now presiding over Italy. Among both beasts and men, it was an absolute law of nature that the weaker must submit to the stronger, and that supremacy lay with those most perfectly equipped to enforce it. That was why their forefathers, far superior to them in courage, physique, and every other resource too, had submitted to the Romans, a course they would never have contemplated if they had not recognized that God was on the Roman side. Uh, Let's see, this is still Josephus yelling at them, I think, and he says... um, So I am sure that our God has abandoned his holy places here and is standing now with the enemies you are attempting to fight. But then it says, Josephus narrates after his big speech here, for all this emotional appeal by Josephus, the insurgents would not budge. He describes the temple. It is unbelievably rich. I mean, it's lined with gold and jewels. It sounds like the most magnificent thing that's ever been built on the planet. And like I said, to me that suggests they had enough military might and political power to protect it. Um, Listen to this section. 
For the Jews, the sealing of all exits put the seal also on any hope of survival. The famine strengthened its attack and began feeding at large on whole families across the generations. The roofs were filled with women and babies in a state of collapse. The streets with dead bodies of old. Children and young people, swollen with hunger, roamed the market squares like a collection of ghosts and would fall to the ground wherever they happened to be when the end took them. The burial of relatives was beyond the strength of the sick, and a duty avoided by those still in good health because of the pure numbers of the dead and the personal risk involved. Many people fell dead while burying others. Uh, There was no lamentation, no weeping at all this death. Famine negated emotion. Deep silence reigned in the city and the darkness laden with death. Worse still were the terrorists, that is, inside the city. Um, As they came to the point of expiry, all filled their last gaze on the temple and departed with the insurgents still left alive. At first, the insurgents had the bodies buried at public expense as the smell was unbearable. When this could no longer be maintained, they threw them from the walls into the ravines. When Titus, on his rounds, saw the ravines clogged with corpses and pools of putrefied matter oozing out from the decomposing bodies, he groaned aloud and raised his hands to heaven, calling God to witness that this was not his doing. That is, you know, Titus didn't kill all these people. These people were killed by their own doing. On, uh, let's see, book 5, section 570, 563. Roman emperors had always honored and embellished the temple. Here was the Jew ripping out the gifts which even foreigners had made to it. Uh, skipping a little, Josephus says, I believe that if the Romans had been slow to move against these sinners, either the earth would have opened up and swallowed the city, or it would have been swept away by the flood, or the thunderbolts which destroyed Sodom would have struck again. The city had produced a generation far more godless than those afflicted by such catastrophes in the past. These were people whose madness involved the whole population in their ruin. <clears throat> Remember, this is while St. Paul is writing his letters, basically, or right after, before the Gospels were written, dirtly, you know, a generation after Jesus, right? At one point it says, uh, well, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but dot, dot, dot. With that, she, that is one of the Jewish women in the city, killed her son, roasted his body, and ate half of it, then covered up and saved the rest. Thus, as Chuck Baldwin and others have noted, fulfilling the prophecy in Deuteronomy 28.53 about, about the destruction that would come upon them if they, you know, if they didn't listen to God, that women would eat the offsprings of their own womb. <clears throat> A little bit on the zealots, and then I'll have to be done here. Uh, No, the truth is that what gave you the incentive to fight the Romans was the Romans' own generosity to you. First of all, we allowed you to occupy this land and installed kings of your own race. This This is one of the Romans speaking to the Jews. Then we preserved your traditional laws and gave you complete freedom to manage not only your domestic affairs, but also your external relations as you wished. Above all, we gave you the right to levy a tribute for God and to collect offerings with those who brought them meeting no objection or interference from us, only to increase your wealth for use against us, and to see our own contributions funding your preparations to make war on us. So then, in the enjoyment of all these privileges, you turned this this excess of prosperity against those who gave it to you, and like badly trained snakes, spat your victim, sorry, spat your venom at your charmers. Um, I think this is Titus still speaking to the zealots. I came to this city with severe orders, reluctantly given by my father. I was pleased to hear that the general public wanted peace. As for you, I called on you to desist to, to de, to, sorry to desist before it came to war, and for long after you did start the war, I let you off lightly. I guaranteed the safety of deserters and kept faith with them when they fled to me for refuge. I showed pity for many of the prisoners we took and stopped those keen to torture them. 
I did not want to have to bring siege engines against your walls. I was constantly restraining my troops as they thirsted for your blood. After every victory, I invited you to make peace, as if it was I who had been defeated. And then when I was coming close to the temple, I deliberately ignored the usual rules of war and begged you to spare your own holy places and keep the temple safe for yourselves. I offered you freedom to leave with a guarantee of safe conduct, or if you preferred the option of battle on some other ground. You scorned every offer and set fire to the temple with your own hands. Okay, Uh, so that's about all I can read here, Um, just to finish up my reflections on this. So that's, I mean, so basically, that was the first Roman-Jewish war. Rome won. Uh, I mean, boy, it was ugly. Like, the the, the estimates are between 1 and 2 million Jews were dead by the end of it. Essentially everybody, uh, those who hadn't fled, everyone left in the city was dead. They burned it to the ground. Then there was another war between the Jews who were sort of trying to mount a counterinsurgency and Rome again in around 115. I think Trajan maybe was the emperor by then. And then the big final war with Hadrian um, from 132 to 135 thereabouts, Hadrian literally tore the city down brick by brick to the ground and dug up the foundations of the city and then banned circumcision throughout the empire. (laughs) And so that gives you some idea of, you know, what had begun as just an attempt to be an accommodating empire uh, just didn't go the right way. And in the end, I mean, it, it led to kind of complete and total destruction. And again, as I said, early Christians all, to a person, understood this to be the just hand of God, really fulfilling the promises given in Deuteronomy 28, and that this this kind of complete desolation of the city was proof that God had transferred his loyalty to, you know, the Christians, essentially, right, to the Roman Christians who would follow. And uh, so I will come back to this in the future when we talk about things like maybe Justin Martyr or maybe I'll do an episode someday on like Athanasius or um, Tertullian. I mean, these guys all say the destruction of the temple is the fulfillment of God's promises. And this is why, like, again, Handel sings hallelujah about it because in his mind it is essentially proof of God that the few good, the few who listened to what Jesus was teaching um, were saved. Obviously, this is all you know, controversial in theological terms. But if nothing else, even if you take it out of theological terms, what you have is another excellent, crucial, important un- like, uh, depiction of the total war that just was driving the world crazy in the first century um, until this idea of Logos. And I don't have time to go through it all, but if you want to see the solution, you can read Ephesians chapter what is it? Chapter 2, I think? Is it 2 or 6? Chapter 2, verses 11 through 16, I want to say, where, Jesus, where Paul talks about the one new man. We used to be two, the circumcised and the uncircumcised, but now we are one, and we have put aside the enmity that used to divide us. So this was the solution to the problems of the ancient world, and really it lasted for a solid thousand years, more or less. Um, of good times and relative peace throughout all of Europe and most of the Mediterranean.